Hallelujah. I'm starting a new message series this week called Rhythms. I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, while you do that, welcome up Kevin Vargas, if you would. <clears throat> Don't you love Jesus? They done messed up when they introduced me to Jesus and found out he was alive. They done messed up when they told me he was alive. What? Heard about him, but then I met him, found out he's alive. He's alive. He's alive, Kevin. Hallelujah. 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 So, um, yeah, how about that? Yeah. Make no apologies for what Jesus might do in this moment. Come on. Him being alive and all. Hallelujah. Kevin and I were in Mexico together recently. Yeah, we had a good time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, either clap or don't, you know. Let's make up our mind. <laughs> Kevin, we, were in a, we had a mission trip to Mexico. It was a good time. So y'all remember the um, story about the karate chop woman? That's who's coming. Yeah, and so if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're a visitor, she's going to do a nice Bible study. But you might get the drop kick from heaven, too, so we'll find out what happens. So, um, Kevin Vargas, you got the, the mic on? So, um, it, you know, we, we uh, ha, huh. it's good in here, yeah? Just touch your neighbor and say, it's good in here. Say, get you some of that. Tell them, get you some of that. <laughs> get you some of that. Yeah? It's good, right, Mike? It's good up here. I don't know what it's like in the back, but it's good up here. Okay, no, no, I'm moving on now. Focus, 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 focus. <clears throat> so, ha. All right, let me just say this. I have a message. It's longer than normal, so I need to get through this quickly. Whew. But I'm getting rocked. And Lillian's getting rocked. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, listen. Let me get off the stage. Maybe that'll help. Shaba. <clears throat> listen, we believe that God is alive, yeah? yeah. It's a new sound stage. And, um... And sometimes God does stuff and it makes people look weird. Right? God is never weird. God is never weird. Sometimes we're weird in God's presence though. Like if you remember the prayers you prayed when you were a new believer, you'll go, oh, I'm glad he didn't answer that prayer. That was weird. Anyway, so sometimes the Holy Spirit will land on people in our services. Well, often. Uh, and they'll look weird. And you can just think, well, that's weird. And some people want to look weird, so it's a good excuse to be weird. Uh, but other people, you don't want to look weird, and so you'll guard against it. And so we never ask, like, what? We don't ask often enough, what happened in that moment? And instead, we just kind of formulate in our mind that things are weird. And uh, what I've been doing in the last service of the service, just inviting some people up who uh, have recently had an encounter with God in the middle of a service. And uh, last week, or excuse me, last service, we heard about someone who the anointing fell on him in the back row, the whole row, actually. And uh, they just kind of caught on fire back there. And uh, their whole life changed. They got delivered from stress and anxiety and inability to sleep. Their knee got healed. And in a moment of God touching them. Now, the weird thing is that if God touches you and nothing weird happens, that's the weird thing. Now, if the God of heaven comes and touches you, you would expect something different to happen. Right, Lillian? Right? Hallelujah. So Kevin recently, Kevin had an encounter with God in one of our meetings, yeah? You need the microphone at this point? Yes. Excellent. And so um, tell, us, uh, give, tell us what happened. Now listen, Kevin will get the preach on him here. No. I got a message to preach, so stay focused. All right, oh, look, she's crawling away. That's awesome. Go ahead, Kevin. Tell him what happened. So I was sitting in the back, and pastor had said some stuff. Right? Like, he saw the glory in the back, and so he was praying. And, um, like, mm. personally, I, I, I don't like attention anymore, right? I, I, I used to love it. I used Shabbat. to fiend for it, um, and I don't. So anything that has to do with attention, like even being right here, I don't want mm -hmm. um, because I had such an unhealthy desire for it. So when he prayed over me, um, like, it was very uncomfortable for me. 
and I f shot to the floor not knowing why. Like, I didn't feel any, like, I just flew to the floor. And I'm like, oh. You felt the ground, though, I'm yeah, imagining. I felt, yeah, yeah, I fell to the ground. And I was like, while I was there, I was like, God, thank you for not making a scene, you know? Because I was like, I don't want the attention. And, he, <laughs> and here you a, are. He's such a that. good God. <laughs> <laughs> And so, but what, what, what's, what's amazing is what happened afterwards. Um, there was a meeting uh, for some leadership stuff. I had no idea, like, I thought I was in the wrong meeting. I had no idea what the meeting was about. And um, the first thing that pastor does was like, hey, let's all get in a group and get vulnerable. And I was just I was like, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this, you know? <laughs> And I got really upset, and so I sat by myself, and then all these group of guys got around me, and I was like, I was being a jerk, you know, not trying to open up, like, just really being a jerk, and just like not trying to be there. And I, and, and something happened to me in Mexico, and so when this thing was 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 in my heart, and it just came out in the place of being vulnerable, I, I got really mad, and so we transitioned to worship, and I'm like, God, this this thing is coming up again. I thought we had a discussion about this, you know. <laughs> And um, in Mexico, and I was, I was should really, be done now. We yeah, should be should done. Be we done. had a discussion about it. it should yeah. be done. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, two years. I of need nonsense. to enter into that. I need to enter into that. And Go so, ahead. And so, um, during worship, I was, I was just like, I was upset that I got upset, you know. And and um, I remember um, last year, I was like, God, I, I, I don't want any of this. And if and if you're gonna bring it back, it has to look different. It has to look different than for me, like pursuing it, longing for it for the wrong reasons, you know. And so God was like, and during worship, he reminded me of what happened in Mexico. And he was like, Kevin, I, I, we're doing this together. Come on. You know, you're not alone. And there's people here for you Come and on. with you. Come on. And, and, and right before worship, um, like I sat all the way in the back and pastor was like, oh, come up forward, Kevin. You're all the way in the back. He kept calling my name. It was like very uncomfortable because I didn't want the attention. You know, so I, during worship, I'm like, God. To avoid that, I'm going to sit up right there in that corner in the front so he doesn't have no reason to call me. During the meeting. During right? the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I made it. I came up with a plan with the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, this is what's going to happen. I don't want the attention, you know, because how unhealthy it was. So I sat down and he's, you know, we all sat it down. And the first thing he's like, so Kevin, how was worship? <laughs> I couldn't answer that because I'm like, I literally sat here to avoid you calling my name, you know, and, um, and then. We were praying, and some angel stuff happened. And then what's so significant about that, yeah, so um, I was just completely consumed by fire. And what's so amazing was, like, during the end, God was like, this looks different. Come on. Wow. You know? And I was like, all right. So, yeah. Do that again? What? Huh? Do that again? Amen. Come on, get up for Kevin, everybody. Get up for Mikey. Hallelujah. <clears throat> hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise God. God's doing stuff. And if he was talking in code, it meant something to him. Amen? I got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so I'm starting this message series, uh, two weeks, uh, called Rhythms. In uh, Colossians, I believe, uh, chapter... Two, no, three. Colossians 3.16, Paul said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Ha. Huh. Let the word of God richly dwell within you. You're like, what's so funny? Some people look weird when God touches them. You pray, God, I'll be a fool for Christ. And he's like, okay, I want you to look foolish. And he's like, mm, I don't mean that. I mean, I'll be a fool on my terms. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Here's the question we're trying to answer at Revival Life Church is how do you make revival stick in a person's life? How do we make revival 
stick. Now, I love the encounter. We live for the encounter with God here. I love the full body hug of God. I love being overwhelmed by my Father's love. I love Jesus loving me where he finds me and loving me so much he's not going to leave me there where he found me. I love, oh my, I love Holy Spirit coming and transporting me to another realm, a realm of faith where his words make sense, right? Like where I'm willing to lay down my life for Jesus. I, I love, I love that moment, but how many of you know we can't take Corey and the band with us everywhere we go? Now soon, soon at the iTunes store, you will be able to. <laughs> Come on. If we ever actually release this album with our songs, you will actually. <clears throat> but the goal is, how do we make revival stick? How do we live in this moment all the time? How do we, how do we continue? How do we continue? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, hallelujah. Now, I tend, my gifting is such that I tend to see the 10,000 foot view of things, right? I'm rarely like on the, you know, do these things side of things. It's not how my brain works. It's not how I believe Jesus taught. However, there is a place for it because we know one of the fivefold giftings is teaching, right? So there is a place for it. And so what we're trying to do in this house is try to make room for more gifts. So how many of you enjoyed Christopher Rajkumar's uh, uh, message last week? He gave the holy finger. Go ahead. Holy finger. There it is. Hallelujah. It wasn't me. It was Jesus. I've read Jesus' sermons. They were better. But that was really good. That was really good. Christopher's was super good. Jesus were better. He's better than all mine. I talked for 40 minutes based on one of his sentences, and it's still not as good as his sentence. It's, it's absolutely true. But the goal is, how do we make this thing? And so I look at like this 10,000-foot view, and so um, I, I look at things a little different, and I don't, I don't get offended with what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say what you learned in the past is wrong. Just saying this might be another way of looking at things. So we know that Moses went on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments, Yeah. Yeah, we even have a picture of them. Uh, we had a photographer there at the time snapping photos. That's it. That's an actual, it's probably an iPhone picture right there of the Ten Commandments themselves. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, and so <clears throat> here's what I believe. Remember how Jesus, um, Jesus said, um, he talked about how the owner of the vineyard kept sending messengers and they kept getting the message wrong. And finally, he sent his son. Right? And we know that Jesus is the son of God. And, and so we know that Jesus is perfect theology. Amen? Amen. Jesus is perfect theology. Uh, and, 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 we, and we also believe that, um, that Jesus Christ is God's will personified. Amen? In bodily form, right? And we know that God doesn't change, right? Okay. So that means that we might be getting his message wrong sometimes. If you've ever received a mean prophecy, you know what that looks like. People getting something from God, but getting it wrong. Right? And so, and so perhaps, perhaps the Ten Commandments weren't meant to be rules. Let me, let me ask you this question. How many of you need a rule not to murder people? I don't need that rule. I personally don't need a rule not to murder people. I don't need a rule not to cheat on my wife. Like, I want to keep my marriage good. I don't need a rule. Like, it's perfectly legal for me to cheat on her. I'm choosing not to do that. Amen? I don't, yeah. My, I'm, I've been keeping that rule for almost 20 years now, right? You know, amen? Yeah, that's good. Uh, but I don't need a rule for it, right? I don't, I don't need a law for that because... Uh, you know, like, I don't, need a, I don't need a rule not to lie to people, like, because I just don't want to be a liar. Right? Like, so, so, so but there, here's these commandments. And, um, <clears throat> and let me say this, and I don't want to offend anybody. I, um, I think the way to, um, to keep, uh, to, 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 to get rid of abortion in America is to get people saved. Come on. Right? Like, I understand, I appreciate, I appreciate what people are trying to do through the legislature, but how many of you know that won't actually stop abortion? I don't want to have an abortion. Well, I mean, I can't physically receive one, but I mean, my family, like if we get pregnant, we're having the baby. Like, and I don't need a law to tell me not to. 
because Jesus Christ lives in my heart. Therefore, how I look at things is different. I don't need the law to tell me morality. I have morality. And so perhaps what God has always wanted is what Jesus Christ came, and that's to have fellowship with God. What God always wanted was fellowship with man, right? Jesus Christ was the perfect representation of that, but God never changes. That was always God's desire. And so hear me on this for a second. We have these Ten Commandments. Now, we've taught before that the first three commandments were how we're to view God, right? I don't know about you, one more time, I don't need a law to tell me not to have more than one God. I'm perfectly happy with the one I have. I'm perfectly happy with the living God. I don't need a rule to tell me not to worship other gods. I am fully aware that all other gods are false, that I have met the living God, and I'm perfectly satisfied with him in, his, him, in my life, right? And so we, we've talked about how the first three um, uh, commandments uh, pointed us to look at God and receive him as God alone, to be perfectly satisfied with him as God. And if we continue to look at the commandments, commandment 5 through 10 tell us how to view our neighbor. How to treat our neighbor. Let's not lie to them. Let's not murder them, right? Let's not steal from them, right? Like, he tells us how to treat our neighbor. I feel like I've read this somewhere else. I feel like another prophet has said this before. Oh, yeah, his name was Jesus. And he told us about how to love God and love our neighbors, right? This is what God has always been after. And in between this first through third commandment and this fifth through 10th commandment, we find the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, of course, was a day of rest. Now, we, for us, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. So if we were to look at the Ten Commandments here, we stand in the fourth commandment, in Jesus Christ, our Lord, looking back to God, the first three commandments, that He is our God. There is no other God, and we're not to replace Him with something that we create on our own. And we look forward to commandments 5 through 10 in how we love our neighbors, how we demonstrate the love of God to Him. We stand on that fourth commandment, in it, Jesus Christ, the living God, our Sabbath rest, not trying to create our own righteousness, but receiving his through faith in God. And then we get to spread that with our neighbor. Does this make sense? This is, this is kind of makes sense to me. This is what God has always been after. And so instead of this relationship, people start breaking down rules because rules are easier to keep than actually, as Kevin said, get vulnerable. It's easier to just keep rules and say, no, 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 I've kept the rules and to say, what's really going on in my heart? And God, of course, is after our heart. We can perform all we want, but he's after what's going on in our heart is what matters. Amen? We've all met people who've grown up in church but haven't actually been converted yet because they've been taught it's all about acting like a Christian. And so they've mastered the art of acting, haven't mastered the art of having an actual relationship. And so... So here we are, we come into this atmosphere of encounter. Uh, we want to live in an atmosphere of encounter, amen? But we come into these atmospheres of encounter, these moments that transcend our reality, where God comes in with his supernatural presence and shifts the natural presence that we're used to living in. And when we're in that supernatural presence, he says things to us that completely contradict the reality that we're living in. He starts telling us to do things that make absolutely no sense to our natural mind. He tells us to love people and to forgive people and to, and to give things away and to give up ambitions and to quit striving and maybe to trust and lower our guard. And, 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 it's, and it seems so freeing in the moment, but the moment we leave that presence, all of a sudden there's a war that begins. Anybody know what I'm talking about? seems so simple in worship to give him everything. It's hard to leave it there when we leave the moment, right? And uh, what, what we find is there's a reason for that, and it's not just because you're stubborn and you don't want to follow God. That, I mean, no matter how much condemnation wants to tell you that's what it is, that's, for most of you, that's not what it is. <clears throat> the problem is what God speaks to us in that presence is completely contradictory to what's happening in the world around us. There is a pressure. There's a force in our world 
that wants to force us to constantly be producing, consuming, striving for more. A more that is absolutely never satisfied. You can never produce enough. You can never consume enough. You can never have enough. And in the 10th commandment, God in His wisdom knew this because there is nothing new under the sun. And in the 10th commandment, He breaks it down really, really simply. In Exodus 20, verse 17, He says, You shall not covet. You shall not covet. Now, you can look at the technicalities of that commandment not to covet. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't need a rule again to tell me not to try to steal my neighbor's wife, right? Like, I got enough problems with the one I got already, right? And she's, she's, she's godly. She loves Jesus, right? I have enough trouble just trying to be a good husband to one. Why you would try to replace it and start all over again, I have no idea. I got 20 years into this one. Why would I possibly want to start again, right? Those those fights are waiting for you again in the next one. Like, let's just get this worked out right here. (laughs) Hallelujah. I don't want to go through that again. Hallelujah. So it tells you, don't covet your neighbor's wife or their house or their male servant or their female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to his neighbor. And so you can come away from that saying, okay, I'm not allowed to want to steal my neighbor's stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is it possible there's something bigger God's trying to communicate than don't steal your neighbor's stuff? Is there possibly something bigger? Because is it okay for the guy next to your neighbor? I mean, or is God trying to communicate something bigger? Don't covet. And this, this, this coveting, this coveting is this constant need for more. It's just we have to get more. We need to produce a little bit more. We need to be a little more active. If only I had a little bit more. Now, they love today to bash social media, uh, but social media is not a new thing for this generation. There's always been social media. It used to be called gossip, but now we gossip about ourselves, right? So that's what they call that social media. But there's always been the comparison game on the earth. There's always been the comparison game on the earth. This is nothing new. People are scared of the new. There's nothing new under the sun. Again, this has always been happening. People have always been trying to brag. People have always been trying to show out. People have always been trying to say, look, I have finally achieved the more. And it's always been a lie. And this is why God is like, don't fall in this trap. And he calls it coveting. Don't covet. Why? Because we cannot be coveting our neighbor's stuff and be standing in the Sabbath. We cannot be standing in the Sabbath rest saying, God, what you provide is enough, and say, if only I had a little more. Ministers who don't learn this lesson turn their ministries into a pipeline for their ego, and it gets so unhealthy. Jesus talked about this, um, and I'm going to, he talked about it in Luke, well, he didn't talk about it in Luke chapter 12. Luke wrote it down in what we've called the 12th chapter of his, uh, his book. And I'm going, to put, I'm going to quote it in the message because the, the last phrase is a little cleaner. It means the same thing. Jesus said, they said, take care. Let's look at this. Take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have. Watch this. Even when you have a lot. Life is not defined by what you have even when you have a lot. A lot. What's he trying to tell you? Is he trying to say, if you have a lot, you've missed it? No, he's saying, quit trying to strive for a lot. (laughs) You got, like, it is not going to satisfy. The question is, how much do you need? And the answer is always just a little bit more. Wherever you're at, no matter how far you've come, this world will tell you you need just a little bit more. What you've achieved isn't quite enough. If you look back, you're pretty excited about how far you've come. But if you look at the world, you just need to come a little bit farther. And it's like that, you know, early algebra problem you learn, and they, your algebra teacher teaches you if you travel halfway there every single time, you'll never get there. And you're like, how's that possible? Because <laughs> the closest you'll ever get is halfway there. There'll always be more. And Jesus came to be our Sabbath rest to deliver us from the need for more. Is, it, is this making sense? This is why he is 
our Sabbath. So we encounter God in these first three commandments. We love Him. We love His presence. We say we don't need any other God. And we look out to the world and all we see is lust. And we see greed. And we see striving. And we wonder, what, what happened? Where, where did things go wrong? Let me ask you a question. Who, who is old enough to remember June 2007? Who is old enough to actively remember because there's a whole bunch of people who are like, of course, that's not that long ago. There's a lot of people with their hands not up, right? <laughs> like time moves on. So in June 2007, something monumental took place. A phone came out. A little phone came out called the iPhone. Came out in June 2007. Now, if you don't remember that date, this world has always been your world. Uh, but for those of us who are old enough to remember before the iPhone, I remember I had this cool uh, little, 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 Blackberry, right? Remember, remember the Blackberry? Had a, had the, we finally had like a nice keyboard and that little ball you could move around. My wife had like a bootleg Blackberry. We called it the Crackberry because the ball kept falling out. <laughs> we, we feel like at some point somebody exchanged this phone for some substance at some point. We're not, we weren't exactly sure. It wasn't, it wasn't a quality item, but she was happy to have it. <laughs> but if, you, if you're, again, if you're old enough to remember when this phone first came out. Do you remember, do you remember the commercial? The commercial was, uh, they showed this, and, and they had like the iPod Touch, which looked the same. And, uh, and the neat thing about it was you could play music on it, and you could do a map with it, and you can get Wi-Fi on it, and it had all these things you could do. And if you remember the commercial, they were flipping through, like, oh yeah, the iPod Touch could do that. Oh yeah, yeah, there's things that could do that. And then it, like, a phone call came in. I'm like, oh, and it's a phone, right? Like, it's a, everything, and it's a phone. And so the way they sold this thing was, it was so versatile, and you could use all these apps on it. That was a big deal. All of a sudden, apps were a big deal. Now, on old phones, you had to do, like, 13 different selections to get to what you wanted to do. You had to go, like, file, system, apps, office, email, that email, you know what I mean? It's like a, here's like you just touch it and all of a sudden like, and so all these apps, like this app store came out and people were making money making apps and it was all about the apps and people were so excited about using these apps that they bought the iPhone so they could run the apps on it. But the apps weren't the big deal. The big deal was this new operating system that could run the apps and make Steve Jobs a whole boatload of money, right? Like it was the operating system that was the big deal. But we live in a world that's excited about the apps. They get up close. They don't understand the operating system. If I can use this, just stretch it a little bit farther. In the church today, we get so excited about the apps, the four steps to a better marriage and the three steps to getting your finances together and the nine steps to knowing God. And, and, all the, and we don't back up and learn this new operating system, which is actually Christianity, standing on this in the Sabbath, viewing God and viewing people. Amen? And so instead of, amen. So in the church today, it's like, I love the church. I love everybody who calls on the name of Jesus. I have friends who do church very radically differently than me, and I love them, and I love the harvest that they're seeing. But for us and what we're called to do, we're called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and get people to have encounters with God. In effect, get people to live under a new operating system. That is the power of Holy Spirit instead of the power of this world. Now, the things about the laws of God is they work no matter who gets involved in them. If you forgive people, you will live in more peace than people who don't forgive. If you are generous, the Lord will bless your hand. I mean, it is, they are laws, and whoever takes part in them will get the benefit of them. These are the apps. Well, we say you can have all those apps and more if you get the right operating system. Is this, is, and so, and so what, what we're trying to do uh, at Revival Life Church is get people to replace the system of this world with the power and presence of Holy Spirit in their lives. Therefore, God can lead us into all things He wants us. Now, the operating system of the church is supposed to be the presence of God, salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to have intimacy with God, to have victory over sin, and to be empowered for mission. That is the operating system we're supposed to live under instead of the operating system of this world, which is greed, and you need to strive for more. If you look at advertising in the coming week, you'll notice that every advertiser is communicating one message. If you just buy what I'm selling, your life will be better. 
That's all advertising. And if you're an advertiser, you're like, of course, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. If you follow anybody on Instagram that sells anything, you'll just see through their Instagram feed that your life will be better if you just do what they tell you to do. And God is like, if you just let me be your Sabbath rest and stop striving for your own, your life will be better here and in the age to come. And so once we have the right operating system, then we can begin to use apps to bring out everything that's baked into it. Once we get the right operating system in our life, then all of a sudden, forgiveness gets exploded in grace in our life. Once we get the right operating system, then generosity becomes a river of prosperity. Once we get the right operating system, then our relationships with God and our relationship with people and, and, and the skills that we learn all of a sudden begin to multiply, not just for us, but our family and generations to come. Amen? And this is what we want to talk about today. How do we make revival stick in our lives in a way that we get to carry this encounter that we have into our entire life? Amen? So I'm going to try to get through this fairly quickly, uh, but it's going to be a little bit longer than normal, but I will get you out pretty close to on time, okay? Hallelujah. Now, we know that greed is the power of this world, and Jesus was trying to let us know, listen, you can't follow the advertisers and follow me. You can't follow the power of this world that tells you you need more and follow me. It wasn't a rebuke to say who's not a follower. It was, a, it was, it was an encouragement to say you have to actively choose to not be carried away by this stream of the world. He said, he said it in, uh, it's recorded in uh, Matthew chapter 6, 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, the word there is mammon, which is wealth personified. It is a spirit that wants you to need more. You can't serve both. And what we want to do in this message series briefly, I want to provoke you, and I want to encourage you to come up with a new rhythm in your life. As opposed to marching to the beat of this world, we want to flow with the rhythm of the kingdom of God. We want to flow in the rhythms of, of God's heartbeat where he says, listen, be at rest. Spend time alone with me. The world says you don't have time to spend with me, but I say if you spend time with me, you'll have plenty of extra time for everything you need to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you, not the other way around. And that's what the world tells you. Strive after the things you need. That's how you get them. And if you have time, give some to God. We don't want to give the God, God the tips of our finances, and we don't want to give him the, a tip from our time. Does, does this make sense? So we have decided a long time ago at Revival Life Church that prosperity is not about wealth. It's based on the presence of God in our lives. Prosperity is the freedom to make good choices. And, 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 and we want to guard that presence. We want to guard the presence of God in our lives. And so for that reason, we need to discipline ourselves to live an intentional life with God. We don't, we don't do disciplines to get God. We do spiritual disciplines to protect the presence of God in our lives. Paul told Timothy in, in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7, he said, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's so we can walk out what has been revealed to us. Not to get something new, but so that we can have it in every area of our lives. You see, spiritual disciplines create godly rhythms in our lives. Spiritual disciplines create godly rhythms in our lives. We have to purposefully practice spiritual disciplines so we can change the rhythm of our lives so that God can actually sit on the throne of our life. Now, there's two basic categories of spiritual disciplines. There are inward disciplines, and there are outward disciplines. There's private ones that are between just me and God, and I'm alone, and it's just God and I, and nobody normally sees them or what's happening but me and God. But that is just the first three commandments. When we look at 5 through 10, there are outward disciplines in that we, uh, we discipline ourselves for godliness outwardly. And uh, we're going to talk about the outward disciplines next week. This week, very briefly, I'm going to talk about three inward disciplines. Now, if you have the handout, I have six listed there. And I want to encourage you at the end of this message to kind of read through that and the scriptures that come with them and begin to ask God, 
How do I incorporate these into my daily life uh, so you don't have to get distracted? The three that I am not covering today is fasting. Say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not covering, but let me tell you this, though. Uh, I believe in 2020, uh, as a house, we're going to be fasting more. I don't, you know that's not the work of the flesh for me. But I feel like we're going to be fasting more. Uh, the second one we're not covering today is solitude. And the third is the Sabbath. There's wonderful things to read on that, and God may be speaking to you through it. So go ahead and uh, study those scriptures. But the three I am talking to, I'm going to start with studying the Bible. Uh, just Bible intake, right? We need to read our Bible every day. We need to read our Bible every day. Amen? amen. And if you don't say amen, I don't care. Amen. We need to read our Bible every day. Why do we need to read our Bible every day? Because we need to purposefully set aside time to hear God. And there's no easier way than reading your Bible. Now, studying your Bible falls under two categories. If you've taken notes, write this down. There's informational and there's formational. And in and, and Colossians 3.16, again, Paul wrote this. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now, if that word is richly dwelling within you, then you have something to draw from. I want my money to richly dwell in the bank. Amen? I don't want it to, to brokely be in the bank, right? I don't want it to be barely dwell in the bank. I don't want it to be overdrafting dwelling in the bank. I want it to be richly. Now, if I say that your money is richly dwelling in the bank, what is the picture that comes to your mind? Like more than enough, right? Like, like something you can constantly be drawing from, like, right? Without overdraft fees. Amen? Like some of you just received that by faith in the name of Jesus, right? Amen. So what, is it, what would it look like for the Word of God to richly dwell in you? You're going to have to put some deposit action before you can richly draw from it, right? And so we read the Word of God every day for two reasons, uh, for informational and formational. Do you have that on a slide? Informational and formational. Now, informational reading the Word of God is so that we can study the Word. We read informationally so we can study the Word. We read formationally so the Word can study us. Wow. Right? So informational study is we just, we just go for volume. I want to know the stories of the Bible. Maybe I'm learning some Greek. Maybe I'm understanding the history behind the books. Maybe, maybe I'm trying to get the entire picture of the book of Acts, so I'm reading it in an easier version so I can read the whole story through. Maybe I'm trying to get the picture of what Jesus talked about, so I'm reading the Gospels all the way through over and over just so I can get the story of the Bible. And if you're new to Christ, let me encourage you, read your Bible every day. Make it a habit now. You say, what should I read, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Here's what I want you to read. If you're part of this house, I know some of you may have given you a great Bible study plan, whatever. I do not care. Here's what I want you to read. I want you to read the book of Luke. Say Luke. Luke. Read the book of Luke. Everybody tells people to read John. John is not the easiest book to understand, right? Read the book of Luke. Funny, Luke was written, if you read the beginning of it, for the sole purpose of telling the story of Jesus. Sounds like a good book to read if you want to learn the story of Jesus, right? Read the book of Luke, read the book of Acts, then read Matthew, Mark, John. When you're done with that, read the book of Luke, and then read Acts, then go ahead and read Matthew, Mark, John. When you're done with John, then you can go on to Luke, right? Read Luke, and then Acts, and read Matthew, Mark, and John, once you feel like, wow, I really know this, then you can move on past Acts. Don't go left until you're done going right and you understand what's going on to the right. Don't, don't start in Genesis. I know these right. Oh, I'm going to read the Bible. You start in Genesis. You start getting to the begats, and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> I don't even know what a begat is, but I don't want it done to me. They don't sound like nothing good. Don't be begatting me. I ain't from around here. I'm not a church person, huh? Don't try me like that, right? So just... Stay in the part that we live in. We live in the new covenant. Just stay there, set up a tent, live there for a while, start a campfire, eat hot dogs, stay in the New Testament until you fully get it. Then if you want to venture on in the Old Testament, that's fine, you know. Start with Psalms and Proverbs. Live there for a long time. After you've lived there for a while, go back to the New Testament a bunch, right? Then if you want to look at the history, go for it, right? Through the eyes of the New Testament. Don't view the New Testament through the eyes of the Old Testament. View the Old Testament through the eyes of the New. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Listen, so in, informational, we're, we're reading the Bible to learn the Bible because we get to hear how God speaks and the story of Jesus and why he came. We read the Bible formationally 
so that we can let the Word of God study us. And what that means is I'm reading the Bible to hear God. If you need to hear from God, if you desperately need to hear from God, the easiest way to do that is read the Bible till God speaks. Footnote, this may take a while. God is not a text message away. It just doesn't work that way. He actually wants relationship with us. Right? And the more you read the Bible, the more you learn that Jesus answered the questions you should have asked in the first place. People ask Jesus a question. He's like, let me answer the question you should have asked. <laughs> like, all right. Right? That's, okay. Look at all the questions the disciples asked him and look at how many times they answered, he answered their questions. I think it's once. And so as we're reading the Word of God for God to speak, he starts answering the questions we should have been asking all along. Right? Don't tell him to change the subject. Like, he's like, no, no, no. You need to change the subject. <laughs> I'm not bringing him back. <laughs> Let her go. Hallelujah. That's for somebody. I don't know who. Thank you, Jesus. Not me. Staying married. Hallelujah. Okay. Information and formational. We need to do both. We need to learn what the Bible is saying, and we need to hear God through the Word. Amen? And you need to spend time every day reading your Bible. Like, set the time up ahead of time. Not like, if I got time, you know? Maybe you can't start with three hours, you know? Start with ten minutes every day. Say, I am going to sit here for ten minutes. Some of you are like, ten minutes? Like, most people don't read their Bible ten minutes, right? That's something. Some people are so spiritual, they don't have anything else to do. Check this out. So, read your Bible. Number two. Well, it's actually right there in your paper, but no, Pray. Here's a, here's a spiritual discipline we need to get in the habit of doing. Talk to God, right? Jesus actually talked about prayer. It was actually something he expected us to do. He said it like this. He says uh, in uh, Matthew 6, starting in verse 5, he didn't say if. He said when you pray. And then he said in verse 6, uh, when you pray. And then he said in verse 7, and when you're praying. And then he said in uh, verse 9, then uh, pray this. Luke 11, he said it like this, I say to you, ask, seek, knock. And in Luke 18, he said this, he says, now, he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray. So we need a prayer time in our lives. We need a block of time that we devote to the spiritual discipline of talking to God so that it can spill over into praying all the time. And I want to encourage you to try to get in the habit of just praying in the Holy Ghost all the time. If you're not doing something else, be praying in the Holy Ghost. When you're aware of the presence of God in your life, it's amazing how much He'll speak to you and how He'll speak to you and the divine appointments He'll bring in front of you. When we're not even thinking about God, somebody who needs Jesus comes right across our path and we don't even notice it. Like, I don't want God to have to knock on my head, you know, knock, 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 knock. Hey, I'm bringing this person, idiot. Please tell them about me. Like, I want to be sensitive to the presence of God. I want to be, present, I want to be sensitive to those who are seeking Him. Because I feel like I have enough to share. How about you? I feel like I have enough to share. Like, I don't got everything, but I got a little bit. I got enough to give somebody something, right? And so as we pray, and this is our talking to God. Now, there's times that I pray with a prayer list. There are seasons that I have a detailed prayer list of what I'm praying. And I keep it in a Google Doc because Google's better than uh, iPhone. And uh, I use a Google Doc. Please clap it with me, though. Come on. The iPhone was like the John the Baptist pointing the way toward the, G, the, the, the Android phone, right? Like, it clearly, I understand some people want to stay in a works-based repentance, but I've moved on to the new covenant with the Android phone. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> Shaba. So listen. I will pray with a, with, you can use however you want. You can use, um, you know, a, a Google Doc or, you know, uh, whatever and the iPhone imitation is. Um, what was it, Notes, right? Notes? Notes. So you could, well, here's what I do. I'll keep like a live document that I'll pray through. And as prayers get answered, I just, I delete them. I delete the things on the list. And then I put the new things on it. I don't do a written list because I like to keep it living and updated all the time, right? And I'll pray that for months. And then I'll stop praying it. And I'll just pray as the Spirit leads me over time. And then every now and then, the Holy Ghost will be like, hey, let's do the prayer list some more. So I'll do the prayer list every day. Like, I like to do it twice a day. 
Uh, but as I keep these things on my mind, I can be praying in the Spirit, thinking about them, so I'm constantly in intercession. Amen? So, but if you don't do the, the discipline of praying, then it won't be on your mind to be in prayer. That's why when someone says, you know, like, hey, can you be in prayer about this? Don't just say, okay, pray right there. Because you're not going to remember. We're not going to remember. Just pray right there. And it freaks them out sometimes. And I like doing that too. That's, it's a twofold. <laughs> so also, when I'm praying, I like to have my journal open. Now, here, 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 here's what this means to me. So while I'm praying, I'm journaling. And I also do this when I read the Bible uh, because, watch this, I'm expecting God to say something important. I, uh, this is, I am a weak man, right? I am, I am flawed and I have issues. So it kind of irritates me when I do a meeting with somebody and they don't bring a journal. They don't bring a pad and a paper. It's like, I'm going to meet with you, but I'm not expecting you to say anything that I'll want to remember. And so I'm like, well, then let's just not meet. Like, why are we wasting each other's time? Let's just not meet. So like when I'm in an important meeting, I bring things to take notes. Like you go to school, you take notes while the teacher is teaching. Because you know it's important enough because I want to get a grade. Now, your life is actually more important than the grade you're getting in that class. So you probably want to write down the stuff that God, the great teacher, is telling us so we can actually pass the test and move forward in our life. Amen? Like, yeah, come on. Like, it's a good word. So as as we journal through our prayer time and through our um, reading the Bible time, it helps us to, to discern the word of God in our life. This is not super technical stuff here. We just, we just write down what we feel like he's telling us. We don't have to share it with anybody. We don't have to tweet it. We don't have to preach it. Just write it down. And uh, we get to track. Like, if you're like me and you journal regularly, how many people in here journal regularly during your meditation times? That is pathetic. And um, <laughs> hallelujah. This is the right message. So here's what's awesome. If you don't, if you don't journal, then, then, like, what did God say last year? Do you remember? Do you remember what he talked to you, you know, nine months ago, 11 months ago, 14 months ago? Or, or, or like, or, or if we don't remember what he said, we can't really complain about keep going around the mountain. Wow. 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 <laughs> I, I mean, like, we can't complain we're not getting anywhere because we're not really <laughs> tracking where he told us to go. You ever given somebody directions? And they're like, uh-huh. And like, are you going to write this down? Or, like, you're going to call me and ask me again? Write it down so I don't have to keep telling you the same thing. Any of you guys' kids knows what I'm talking about. Like, I don't want to have to keep saying this, so i got to put notes on things? Like, I've meant it all this, all, your entire life I've meant it. I continue to mean it. Write it down. <laughs> and so God is telling us stuff that might be important. You know, maybe we should write it down, right? Like, and then we go back and we look at it. We can discern what God is saying because it lines up with what he's been telling us. Now, if you're trying to get somewhere in this relationship with Jesus, this is important. Right? Like, we want to be tracking what he's saying. He's not randomly talking. He's actually leading us somewhere. He's actually a good shepherd, right? And so we want to be tracking what he's saying so we can go somewhere. And what I like to do is I read my journal uh, often. I don't read it nearly as much as I read my Bible, but for me, this is the word of God for everybody. The journal is the word of God for Carl. And so as you read what God has spoken to you over time, then you see what he's been speaking to you, and you get re-encouraged. I write down the encounters that I have. I ask people, and they give me a prophetic word. I ask them to email it to me. I write it in my journal. I want to track these things. I want to, I'm really trying to get somewhere in this life. I want you to get somewhere too, amen? And so, and so we, we journal not only, not only just to kind of show God that his words are important. We journal so that we can discern the voice of God, but also we pass on a spiritual heritage to those who come after us. Now, I want to encourage you, if you had a diary when you were in seventh grade, that's not what a journal is. A journal is not where you complain to God about the guy you like who isn't looking at you, right? Like that is not, it's not what it's for. It's not what it's for, right? It's tracking your relationship with God. And oftentimes, that's me in code writing about struggles I'm going through, right? Because one day, I want my kids to look at my journal and see, the, see the, the, the journey that their dad went on to come to this place that I'm at in Jesus Christ. There is a record of me and my relationship with God. And it's a heritage for my children. Amen? Amen. So, yeah, so, so journal while you're praying and reading the Word of God. And uh, finally, Mike, oh, Mike, somebody come up and play the keyboard if you would. Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. She got it. 
Finally, the, the third spiritual discipline, inward spiritual discipline that I'm going to talk about today is praise and worship. And I'm going to talk about this briefly because we're kind of big on that here. Amen? Yeah. I like worshiping God, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, you know that scripture, right? Now, what's funny about that is, um, you know, you can sing songs and not be worshiping in spirit. You're just, spirit, you're just worshiping in truth. You're not worshiping in spirit. Worshiping in spirit is a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. Now, the easiest way to get this worship started is through singing songs with other believers. The, the, the worship that's coming out today is just phenomenal. The, the, just the quality of worship that is out there today, the, the lyrical quality. We're like, oh, we need to get back to the hymns. I'm like, you know how much bad theology is in old hymns? This striving and this religious nonsense. I'm like, I don't want to sing any of that stuff. There's such good stuff coming out today. And as we get to, and as we sing, as we sing songs with other believers, we get to enter into the, the, the prayer life of some of the foremost theologians of our day in the, in the way of the psalmists. We get to like sit in Joel Houston's prayer time as we sing the songs that he's written. We get to sit in Corey's prayer time as we sing the songs that he has written. Does this make sense? And so as we, as we sing these songs together, uh, we get to connect to God on a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship. And the goal for that is that it would transcend the moment in here, and we would be able to take that out there. You see, worship, worship is, is, is focusing on and responding to God. Worship is focusing God and responding to Him. And so for us at Revival Life, worship is not a one-way deal. We don't have a guy up here leading us in song. No, no, no. We have all of us singing to Jesus. Now, they're helping us by giving us a little tune and making us not hear ourselves, which is good for many of us, right? But, but the goal here is we're all singing to Jesus, and we expect Him to be present in that worship. We're not just doing this out of religious obligation. We actually believe that the Spirit of God dwells in this room. But the goal for that is not only that Jesus gets the worship He deserves, which is reason enough, amen? But, but, the, but the goal is that our heart becomes a heart of worship. And now we go out there, our lives start to line up with our morals so we can live a life that's worship to God. And if you're like me, then we get to break some generational curses and we get to raise kids who walk in worship and we get to see the generations that come after us raised up knowing how to be worshipers instead of trying to learn how to break the bondage of this world. We want to live in houses of worship. Listen, if you're a first-generation Christian, man, I got good news for you, man. You are changing every generation that comes after you. You're changing every generation. Or maybe you grew up in the church, but you, your, 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 your lineage wasn't one that was vibrant, where they heard the voice of God and saw miracles and healings and, and just expected children to prophesy. Good news, man. You are changing the direction of your family line. You are changing the direction of your family line. I prophesied this for years. I'm finally living in it. I'm finally living in what I prophesied my entire life. Hallelujah. So we, 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 we want to praise and worship God, not just because it's the first part of service and not just because it's fun. We need to show up. Hear me. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not calling anybody out. Show up on time. To worship God as a spiritual discipline. We come and we sit under the preaching of the word and we worship God in song knowing, okay, my soul needs this. Corey said at the end of worship this morning, he's like, listen, this is the last song we're singing. And that's it till next week. Like, we need to, we, like I, I, my life isn't so floating over the top that I, I have songs to waste. Like, I need to be in here for every song sung, right? Like, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't be like, well, I probably only need two songs this week. For me, I need every song every week. I need to be all in on every song because I need it. Stand with me if you would. Let me pray. <clears throat> I hope that you um, will take this handout, take your notes. And you'll start blocking off some time with God during the week. 
not, maybe this first week you're not going to be able to do it every day. Maybe, maybe you just haven't figured out that rhythm yet. But it's my prayer that as you make a conscious decision to reject the rhythms of this world and walk in the rhythms of God, there'll be a greater grace in your life to make revival stick. Can you say amen? Amen. Thank you. Can we give it up for the, the word this morning? So good. So good. I want to invite our, 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 our ministry team forward. We're going to have people here who want to pray for you before you leave today if you need Stop prayer. Off. But man, I'm excited. You guys excited? Yes. Pastor, do I have time to share a quick testimony? Quick testimony. It's 1245. Take, take me less than a minute. You ready? So, Pastor, we're, you know, everything we're talking about this morning, it's really, this, is, this is, doesn't make sense to the world. This is against the grain. This, this is against the grain. For, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a three. I'm an achiever, uh, a performer. Um, so that means if I want something, in, I, in my mind, I just work harder and I strive and I, I'll get it. But that's not how God works. How many of you, you know that? It, 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 it's, really, it's, really not, it's really not how God works. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, I have a, a business, a family business that I run. And a few years ago, I drove all the way across the state. Because I was trying to get this new customer. There was a big distributor who I wanted. And I drove, drove across the state, had a meeting schedule with him, and he completely blew me off. And uh, uh, I went back. I was, hey, are we going to meet? And just completely blew me off. I, was, I, I slept there that night, called him again the next day, blew me off. And this was a scheduled meeting. I'm like, man, this, this, this stinks, you know. I'm spending gas money, putting, putting in time here, trying to work for this, and nothing's happening. This was probably two and a half, three years ago. And last month, I'm in prayer. And uh, I was out on my paddleboard. It's uh, one of the places I like to pray. And I was just p paddling around. And I'm talking to Jesus. I'm praying for, you know, my family and you guys. And I start praying for my business. And the Lord said, hey, call that guy today. Call that, call that co co company. So I'm like, I don't really want to. He, he blew me off. I'm like, you know, I, I, you know he's, he's, made, he's made it clear what he wants. Like, I don't know. So I'm like, all right. So I get there and I, I call him. It's like, hey, this is, you know, Corey with no expectation. I call him, hey, this, just wondering if, you, you know, we could be of service to you in any way. And he's like, uh, yeah, send me some stuff, uh, uh, a catalog. And so I'm like, all right. Very next week, he places his first order. Look, the Sabbath doesn't make sense to the world. You know, uh, these disciplines do, do not make sense to the world. It's against the grain. It's against the current. But how many of you guys know the world needs this? The world needs this. So what we're going to do today is when you walk out, you're going to grab an invitation card. And this week, you're going to invite somebody to church. And you're going to pick them up on, on the way next Sunday if you have to. And you're going to shoot them a text or remind them if you have to. But we're going to do it because the world needs connection to Jesus. Come on. The, their, their, their spirit is longing for this. Sabbath is prayer. The, the word of God living and breathing on the inside of them. Amen. Amen. So can we give it up for Jesus one more time this morning? I love you guys. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week. Say hello to somebody. and Meet somebody you don't know on your way out. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Also, if you need prayer, we got uh, people up here who want to pray for you. So don't leave here without getting prayer. Love you guys. God bless you. Have an amazing day.